Uh, some of these cells shown in red uh, undergo what I call, what is called physical or chemical changes, okay? And uh, the result of that, uh, <coughs> information is stored there. Now, those cells do not have to be physically connected to each other, okay? They may be, but they don't have to be. Now, what kind of changes are considered uh, to take place? And that is listed in here, according to various uh, studies, okay? So, one is, of course, what is called the synaptic plasticity, including LTP, and then uh, possibly uh, enhanced excitability of the neuron, not uh, just the synapse, but on the neurons. And then there is something called the uh, immediate early gene, uh, set of genes which are quickly turned on uh, during uh, encoding of uh, information, IEG expression, but this is known to be very transient, no more than an hour or two. And then other set of genes uh, turned on and the protein synthesis, new round of protein synthesis take place for certain, for certain set of proteins and eventually also the spine of the synapse goes through the structural changes. One density of the spine also changes. And that information, when the, these cells are reactivated, as I said, by some recall queue, then the information uh, is transferred to the downstream area, eventually including a motor system and so on, and therefore you observe the, what it called the behavioral uh, recall. But uh, the first person, actually, who uh, directly uh, attempt to try to demonstrate that the, the, this, um, the Engram theory of memory is correct is also from Canada. And uh, okay, before I go into that, I want to, uh, let me see, uh, all right, uh, so, uh, the question is how to demonstrate, okay, the validity, correctness of this Engram theory for memory. Uh, so several people had uh, made a certain uh, statement, definitions, uh, that had to be fulfilled in order to demonstrate the Engram theory. And this one is from uh, Martin and the Morris, 2002. And uh, I hope you can see it, yeah. So he says, how to demonstrate the memory engram theory. The final test of any hypothesis concerning memory engrams must be a mimicry experiment in which apparent memory is generated and expressed artificially without usual requirement of sensory experience. And then they go on to say, in one sense, such an experiment would constitute a practical demonstration of the fact that we really do understand how memory works in the same way that the successful engineering feats validate our hypothesis about the nature of the physical world. So, that's uh, Martin and Morris, 2002. <coughs> and then, uh, <coughs> young uh, neuroscientist, again from Canada, Sina Jocelyn, uh, write, uh, rephrased this uh, in her, one of her reviews. So he <coughs> she says, a direct test of memory engram theory would require specifically labeling only the neurons involved in the memory formation, memory encoding, and then subsequently reinstating memory recall by reactivating these neurons. Okay. Um, in fact, um, so we uh, decided to uh, see whether this uh, requirement could be fulfilled experimentally uh, by using a new, new tool, by combining new tools. Uh, so three essential tools uh, were used. First is a method to label the neurons 
activated by encoding or learning. Okay? For this, and for each of these, I will try to elaborate a little bit later. For this, we use the uh, immediate early gene C4 promoter in the transgenic system. Number two is a method to target this labeling to the time window of the encoding of that specific experience, specific memory. And for this, we use so-called uh, tetracycline induction or doxycycline induction system. And the third method is uh, what is called optogenetics, and the method to directly reactivate the specifically labeled neurons uh, later, subsequently. Okay. So for the first one, the use of C force promoter in the transgenic system uh, is based on these earlier studies by Huff and the others that uh, this gene get temporarily activated uh, in neurons, uh, in this case in the hippocampus, when animals go through uh, some episodic learning. Okay. Uh, second, about the restricting the windows of the labeling, labeling the potential engram-bearing cells is uh, uh, illustrated here. So you use a transgenic uh, C4 promoter here, driving a transcription factor called the TTA. Okay, so this is a transgenic animal. These animal, <coughs> uh, if they are grown uh, in the presence of doxycycline in the diet, this doxycycline will bind, even if TTA is activated through, uh, through this learning process, uh, this will bind to this uh, transcription factor, and therefore it prevent the, uh, the uh, DNA, short DNA piece, which is provided by AV, adeno-associated virus infection, uh, called the TET-O. Uh, <coughs> which is followed by channel adoption uh, fields to, uh, in this case, uh, YFP, okay? So this will block the expression of uh, YFP, uh, or channel adoption YFP, because of doxycycline in the, in the diet will bind to this factor, TTA, and therefore you don't get anything. If you switch diet from doxycycline positive to the negative ones, then uh, this blockade is lifted, and therefore, only during that period of time when animal is kept in a dog's, dog's off state, the channel adoption will be uh, expressed, and, uh, and uh, therefore, the cells which are activated by uh, c force promoter uh, will uh, be labeled, will start expressing channel adoption. Okay, so the third one, trick, is, as I told you, is the use of a channel rhodopsin. And if a channel rhodopsin uh, can confer uh, the cell that express, express it, the ability to be reactivated by light of specific wavelengths, the blue light, and hopefully, therefore, help to have uh, the behavior uh, recall to take place. Now, in terms of uh, beha the beha behavior paradigm, we use uh, this very well established contextual fear conditioning. And this is a rodent version of a Pavlov's uh, classical conditioning. So, for those of you who are not familiar, I just spend uh, half a minute to explain this paradigm. On day one, you put a mouse in a chamber, okay, uh, which uh, provide, I just arbitrarily named chamber B, or context B. You let the animal to explore this chamber for a few minutes, animal learn, animal acquire the memory of the feature of this particular context, context B. Okay. Then you give a mild foot shock, electric foot shock, and the animal won't like it, he may jump, uh, but he quickly uh, memorized that this chamber B 
context B is a dangerous place. That's a fear memory. Okay. And then uh, you can demonstrate that the animal forms such a fear memory by, uh, on day one by putting on day, in day two, putting the same, uh, the same mouse into the same chamber, okay, chamber context B. And then uh, if animal has the memory that the chamber B is dangerous, then the day will, uh, animal will uh, freeze, will not move around. And this is because in nature, rodent, when they see the sign of a, a, a predator, then uh, if you keep moving around, you get uh, caught and eaten. So they have learned in the, uh, the evolution, uh, if you send the uh, enemy, then uh, you, you, you don't move around. And that is, uh, kept in the lab, and uh, therefore they freeze. If you put the animal back to uh, another chamber, context A, which is very different from context B, then they will not freeze, they will move around. So it's a context-specific uh, fear memory. Okay. So this is the procedure we use, and uh, as I said, uh, the manipulation is going to be in the hippocampus, and this is a rodent a mouse hippocampus. And then uh, the, I have to explain to you that uh, this con context-specific fear condition paradigm actually involves two kinds of memories combined, okay? So I call this a dual engram, uh, I call it hypothesis, but it's it really facts. Dual engram uh, feature of contextual fear conditioning. So what is shown in the diagram on the left, that's the hippocampus, that's called the internal cortex. Sensory information comes from uh, sensory organs into the internal cortex and it goes through the hippocampus, okay? And then it, it, uh, it modified, calculated, and through internal cortex uh, reaches uh, amygdala, basal lateral amygdala. So that acts as a CS, conditioned stimulus. In other words, in this case, the reactivation of uh, engram um, memory, engram memory, I mean, I mean uh, context memory, act as a conditioned stimulus. Now, according to Hebe's uh, theory, uh, <coughs> you need the US in order to form a new memory. Uh, in this case, a shock uh, come directly, uh, reaches the BRA, and this is where the CS and US meet within the 10 milliseconds uh, time windows, and therefore fear memory engram is formed in BRA, patholateral amygdala, okay? So it is listed here. First, contextual engram are formed in the hippocampus entorhinal cortex network in here, okay? And then the information in the uh, context, uh, contextual engram, uh, reaches the batholateral amygdala coincidentally with the shock information, which reaches BLA directly, forming a fear memory engram. Uh, subsequently, the CS alone, information coming from hippocampus alone, uh, can induce memory recall. So here the basic uh, uh, procedure of our experiment to demonstrate validity of engram theory of memory for episodic memory, okay? So you start with uh, <coughs> transgenic animal, as I mentioned, C4 uh, promoter driving transcription factor TTA, okay? And uh, you inject the AV virus, which contained this genomic uh, structure, channel rhodopsin and EYFP you target the injection of this virus into the hippocampus. In our case, uh, we focus particularly the dentate gyrus area of the hippocampus, as indicated here, okay? And uh, the uh, opto <coughs> optic fibers that will be used in order to stimulate those cell rate uh, is also targeted to the dentate gyrus, okay? So that's the setup we have. So here are the fundamental uh, steps that we took 
in order to, uh, for, for the, the experiment. So you grow animal with a doxycycline, okay? So they never had opportunity to express uh, channel 